So this is a cross-product Sega Mega CD development kit. It's for making Mega CD games. Um, it's date stamped 1992, which will put it at the start of the Mega CD life cycle. The Genesis was probably released around 89, maybe a little earlier. It was a standalone console before this came along and this was just an extra that fitted onto it. It was to add a second processor to the machine, an additional graphics chip and some better audio capabilities as well as a CD-ROM drive so you can store an entire CD's worth of game on there. This is a special bit of kit, right? Yeah, a special bit of kit for games developers to make the games with. So what's your day job? I'm a video games programmer. I've worked at Traveller's Tales, Crytek and Deep Silver Dambuster Studios. Uh, I've worked on about 14 titles so far. It kind of looks like a traditional Mega CD, but it's not. It's all moulded together and screwed together, so it's very much a bespoke piece of hardware. Inside it's got a SNASM host board, uh, and on top it's got a Mega CD daughter board, and on top it's got the Genesis daughter board. And it's all very custom wired inside, so yeah, not exactly a Mega CD inside. It's got two sets of switches, one for the Sega Genesis side, one for the Mega CD side. It's got dip switches to configure things like PAL or NTSC region settings. It's got the SESI ID for it to plug into the PC, uh, one for each side. Um, it's got switches to enable the main CPU and the sub-CPU so you can uh, turn off the Mega CD side and just run the Genesis. It's also got this big emulator button here so that you can either emulate the CD drive through the PC with a big ISA card or you can set it to run from the CD drive itself so you can pop a, a burnt CD inside. On the sides we've got uh, a really big heat sink because there's a very hot component here. It's also got the line out at the side rather than the front. It's got an SESI port direct to PC through a SNASM interface face card. It's also got an emulator port with a very special cable and that's for the CD-ROM emulator. The rest is pretty standard. It's got a, a SCART out, an RF out and the usual audio outputs from the Mega CD. And again the bridge doesn't come open, that's, that's moulded on so this thing can't be taken apart. And a very annoying little whiny fan there which is quite loud. That kind of looks a bit aftermarket, that fan, isn't it? It does um... a little bit. You can tell that they've used a real Sega Genesis shell and they've put some special hardware inside it, so there are some holes here where there used to be ports and there are no longer are. What can you do with it then? I mean, you, tell us why you're showing it as today. Uh, I'm going to show off um, a game that I've been developing on it uh, for the past three years in raw 68,000 assembly language. Uh, so I've got the SNASM interface card to plug it in, which is a big Xilinx chip. It's also got what looks like a battery here, but it's actually the license key to use the software. If you ever use Cubase or something like that, that comes with a dongle, it's a similar thing. Got the nice SNASM2 logo on the back there, so I'm quite happy I managed to find one of these. I'm going to plug this in, I'm going to fire up my game, I'm going to show you how to use the debugger. Put the ISO card in the machine, it's just booting Windows 95 now. This is an AMD K6 200 megahertz machine. Um, it was £5 from a car boot sale. It was the only one I could find that could get the ISO card to work because the bus had to have uh, specific timings on it. It also fails to boot one in three times, so yeah, it's a bit old and knackered, but it does the job. Um, and with this thing, I've managed to make my entire game engine and game, so... Um, I won't argue with it as long as it keeps booting now and again, it's, I'm happy with it. And why is it that you have to use an old machine for this? Is this just, is it an interface thing or what's the... It is, yeah. Um, before PCI we had ISA, which was a big black slot. And this is on the motherboard, is it? This is on the motherboard, yeah, on of the PC. A Sega card is a big heavy ISA card. So let's fire it up and I'll show you some code. Uh, the driver's already loaded, it's already in the, the autoexec.bat, uh, so the SNASM card's ready to go. It's all plugged into the back of the uh, development kit via a looks like SESI a, a cable. Old, very old-fashioned uh, kind of cable, that. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's, a, it's a parallel cable, but it serves a different purpose here. So this is part of the Tanglewood code base. Tanglewood is a game that I'm releasing next year on real cartridge for the Sega Mega Drive, and it's coded in raw 68,000 assembly language. So I'm going to go and show uh, a couple of lines of assembly. So we've got here the entry point, which is the first line of code that the uh, debugger is going to run. First, we're going to jump to a connect debugger subroutine because it's a development kit. It needs the registers set up in a certain way. It needs the uh, CPU vector table set up in a certain way. And because it's a mega CD based kit, we have to restore the horizontal interrupt which is a special thing you have to do specifically for this kit. So afterwards, we're then ready to go and we can type arbitrary code. So I'm going to go ahead and do something mundane here. Uh, so if we move along words worth of data, let's say literal 32, to register D0, then we move along word literal 16 to register D1, 
and then we're going to add the two together with the add op code. So add long words worth of data, D0 and D1 together, and we're going to save that. So basically what you're doing here is you're going to use some very basic assembler language to, to add a couple of numbers together, but using yeah. the, the... But using the real dev kit, yeah, I'm going to show you how the debugger works and uh, how to view the results of that as well. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and build that. I've got a batch file set up ready. It's quite a long command line to do this. Uh, and there we go, that's built ready. Okay, so if I flick on the power first of all, the act light comes on and the write protect goes off. So it's written the ROM ready and then it's ready to go. The screen's blank. So if I open up the debugger here, and this is an old MS-DOS based debugger, mostly done with keyboard shortcuts. So I can go to that CPU entry point function that we had there. And there's the code we just wrote, move 32 to D0, move 16 to D1, and then add D0 and D1. So the first thing we do is reset the CPU. So if I hit execution, reset processor, and then we can start setting breakpoints. So if I hit F5, that'll set a breakpoint on that code. And I can hit nine to go. That's running the executable, that's hit that breakpoint. I've got the registers window down here so we can see what's going on. So our first command here is to move 32 to register D0 in hex, obviously. So if I step once, we can see that D0 changed to 32. And then move 16 to D1, so we can see that D1 changes to 16 in hex. And then add the two together. So add D0 to D1, and that's going to store the result in D1. And there we go. Was that actually running on that dev kit then? Yeah, uh, this, so this executable is running on this dev kit. Uh, with the debugger attached to it so that we can set breakpoints and view real-time values like the memory and the registers as it's running. And for people who've not done much in the way of developing, so a breakpoint is where you can sort of pause the program, is it? Yes, yeah, where you can pause a program at a specified line so you can see what the state of the processor is in at that point in time. So, and if, figure so out. if something's going wrong? You yeah, can... if something's going wrong, you can break a specific line of code and view the memory and see what happened. I've got a demo. This is the main character from my game running around in Sonic Land. This is just a small demo I use to teach programming, how to set breakpoints, how to watch values, etc., how to monitor memory. There's just a very small window here where you can push a thing around with the little physics engine I've got written. I'm not a developer, but it looks quite complicated and laborious. Is it, is it difficult? It, it is, but you can break it down to very simple steps and you can learn one thing at a time. Um, it took me about three years to learn assembly language and how to code for the machine, but it all broke down to very simple steps. Like I showed you moving one number to one register, another number to another register, and then adding two the together. They're all three very simple steps, and you can build on that. From that, you can learn to subtract, uh, multiply, divide. Uh, once you can do that, you can code a very simple player system where you're adding velocity to a player position, etc. Uh, add gravity, you then can, can, can clamp it to the uh, uh, the floor height, etc. So using very simple opcodes like that, it doesn't take that long to get a very simple game system running. The tricky bit is working with the uh, graphics and audio hardware in here, but even then all that can be broken into similarly simple steps. And do you have to end up keeping a lot of this information in your head though? Uh, yes and no. Um, I, I write a blog. Um, so when I started learning 68K Assembler, um, I made sure every line of code I wrote, everything I found out, I blogged on my website um, so that I can come back to it when I've forgotten bits or I'd messed up, I need so to backtrack. You did that kind of like a diary, but could anyone else have a look at that if they wanted yeah, to? Yeah, sure. I'll drop it in the uh, description. Your game then, where are you at with it now? I've finished the first level, which is split into three acts, and it's got most of the main mechanics running. It's now on Kickstarter, so I've used the demo to try and generate some hype for the game. And there's a ROM you can download. You can play using an emulator, Windows, Mac, and Linux. Even some handheld consoles have some emulators, so yeah, you can put the ROM in there and play it on there. If you've got something like an EverDrive cart, which is a flash cart that you can put inside your Mega Drive to put a ROM on, you can actually play the game on your real console at home. Do you think there are a lot of people out there still working on this kind of equipment? I know at least one other developer who is making a game on cartridge. I know one other person with one of these machines in, down in Australia. It's the other known working kit I know of. Um, but other than that, it's, it's quite a rare quite a rare thing to do. There is a small homebrew community, there's some forums you can look at for advice and stuff. And I'm assuming the 6800 was in other machines as well, other devices as well. What yeah, it was. Uh, there were Ataris and Amigas based on the 68K. Um, lots of embedded microcontrollers were based on it. It was a very widely used chip.
Does that mean that a lot of the language that you're using for this is the, is the same across those as well? Or is yeah, it, it certainly applies elsewhere, yeah. So um, you, you could potentially port things backwards and forwards? Yeah, you could do, yeah. Uh, the only specialised parts, really, are the graphics and the sound hardware. Those have to be redone. Uh, but the core language itself is, is usable across multiple machines. We'd like to thank Audible.com for supporting Computerfile. And if you go to audible.com slash Computerfile, there's a chance to sign up for a 30-day free trial and download a free audiobook. Now, today I'd like to recommend the book that I first listened to as an audiobook, which is The Hobbit. Um, back in the day, I had a tape and book, and it was very heavily abridged, and every time you got to the end of a page, there was a ding sound, and you had to turn the page. Well, fear not. Go to audible.com. You can listen to the whole unabridged version of The Hobbit. It probably needs no introduction from me, so check out The Hobbit on audible.com, and thanks once again to them for supporting Computerfile. He'll help you out by giving you his colour. Nim changes to yellow. So now that he's yellow, he can glide. So we can then get past gaps. So there we go. We can fly over that big gap there, continue on. But of course, time isn't on your side, so it's going to change.